Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Tanya Pizzari and I'm sitting here with almost Dr. Brady Green. Welcome to the show. You're listening to the Physical Performance Show and we're about to talk to you about calf injuries. And the is failure is not an option. I've had my ups and my downs. Absolutely breakthrough experience. Welcome to the Physical Performance Show, the show designed to inspire the pursuit of your physical best performance. I'm your host, Brad Beer. Listen in as we delve into how the world's top physical performers achieve their success, as well as the highs, the lows, and the journey of getting there. Let's get ready, set, Let's go. Welcome to the Physical Performance Show brought to you by our upcoming live stream event, Fueling for the Endurance Athlete with UK-based sports dietitian, former guest of the show, Rinny McGregor. Eshot's Bluetooth headphones for cyclists and runners who charge, and of course, Pogo Physio's online telehealth consultations. I'm Brad Beer, sports physiotherapist and exercise scientist by trade and training and founder of Pogo Physio. Each week, we'll bring you the latest and greatest information and inspiration designed to help you perform at your physical best. And of course, we do this across a range of different episodes, expert editions, feature performers, catch episodes, coaches corners, and interest editions. And hot off the back of last week's expert edition, Featuring Dr. David Bailey, Head of Performance for UCI Professional Cycling Team Bahrain Victorious. We keep the Expert Edition theme going and this week you'll enjoy not one but two experts sharing around all things calf strain rehabilitation. If you are an endurance athlete, it's likely at some point that you have experienced the frustration of a calf strain or unfortunately you likely will experience a calf strain at some point. It has been a topic that we have wanted to explore for some time. And here we are, episode 276, with our opportunity. Now, today's featured guests are two exemplary researchers who both hail from La Trobe Sport and Exercise Medicine Research Centre, Dr. Tanya Pizzari and Brady Green, while also fulfilling clinical roles at Mill Park Physiotherapy in Melbourne, Victoria. Tanya Pizzari, PhD, is prolific in the sports injury research space, regularly presenting at international and national sports medicine conferences, lecturing at La Trobe University, and having contributed to in excess of 130 research publications. Meanwhile, Brady Green has submitted his PhD, which focuses on calf muscle strain injuries, and Brady also splits his time with the Essendon AFL Football Club. Now, in 2017, Brady Green and Dr. Tanya Pizzari co-authored a paper, Calf Muscle Strain Injuries in Sport, a Systematic Review of Risk Factors for Injury. This systematic review looked at 518 strains, and we'll discuss some of the findings from this review in this expert edition. Dr. Pizzari and Brady Green share around the what, where, when, why and how of calf muscle strain injuries, share tips around how to get on top of the problem recurring calf strain scenario, discuss contemporary evidence-based best practices when it comes to the rehabilitation of calf strains, debunk common myths around what is effective for calf strain rehabilitation, and of course, issue a great physical challenge for the week. This is an episode for the athletes, coaches, and of course, practitioners. Get your pen and paper ready. Here is episode 276, an expert edition featuring Latrobe Sport and Exercise Medicine Center researchers and physiotherapists Brady Green and Tenny Pizzari on all things calf strain rehabilitation. Tenny Pizzari and Brady Green, you join us from... La Trobe University, uh, the powerhouse of sports medicine research. Welcome to the Physical Performance Show. Thanks, Brad. It's great to be here. Thanks for having us. Thank you very much. Tanya and Brady, combined, you have the unique skill set of practicing clinicians, but also very keen and robust researchers. Brady, your thesis is under examination for your PhD titled Calf Muscle Strain 
injuries in sport. And that is the very topic that we're uh, exploring today on this expert edition, calf strain rehabilitation uh, and tenure. Your work's prolific across uh, a range of different injuries, hamstrings. Uh, I remember you lectured me once on shoulders, so I don't think there's <laughs> anything that you can't do. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take that. Yeah. Thanks, uh, <laughs> Starting with the, the very practical side of things, Brady and Tanya, I mean, what are calf strains? I think we all hear it out there in, in, in everyday sport and participation. I've, I've tweaked a calf, I've strained a calf, but it's a simple question, but how can we paint a picture initially on what calf strains actually are? Yeah, look, I don't think they vary too much from, you know, any muscle strain really, um, just from a very simple point of view. Generally speaking, you know, you, you do an activity that is beyond the capacity of the muscle. Uh, and the muscle response is that some of the fibres in the muscle will tear uh, and you'll get that secondary response from that in, in terms of pain and some swelling in the tissue. Um, and so calf strain, hamstring strain, any type of really muscle strain is, is kind of what we're talking about. So painting the picture, calves are really not too much different in that regard. We'll, we'll go on a little bit. Uh, throughout the time, I suppose, to describe how they might differ slightly from some of the other strains. But just to, to simply say, if, you, if you're exceeded the capacity of your muscle, then you're um, susceptible to having a strain of, those, of that muscle. You've both published work on calf strains uh, in the past. The risks, epidemiology and return to play of calf strain, calf muscle strain injuries, practical implications for any team. That was a presentation that you you gave uh, on Aspatar recently, Tanya, yeah. and I think it was 2017 that you both did a meta-analysis meta of the, the calf strain literature. But I was just going to ask Brady before I throw that next question, what led you to devote four years maybe plus of your professional career to a PhD in calf strains? There must be a strong reason why. So research is something um, I've always been interested in um, and there's always been that pull to, you know, reading and analysing literature even since I was an undergraduate student. And then, you know, once I graduated and began to practice um, clinically, I found myself, you know, often in that pattern where you're investigating further to inform what you're doing. And that led me to become involved uh, at Mill Park Physiotherapy, uh, where I worked with Tanya and Paul Coburn. I guess that evolved even further throughout my career as I began to get involved um, in sport, um, Australian football. And I just enjoy the, the evaluation of the literature and applying it to what we do on a daily basis in a really strong scientific and evidence-based sense. I've heard you both reference the fact that calf strain literature or calf strain rehabilitation literature is quite underrepresented in the uh, in the scientific body of work to date but obviously things will change with uh, your PhD Brady yeah, yeah yeah and I think that was kind of also part of the reason that we were really interested in further analysis in this area like you say Brad there's just not much around it is a significant what well, can create a significant burden for a lot of sports people, a lot of athletes. Um, and as part of the uh, AFL soft tissue registry that, that we run, you know, it's the second most common muscle injury that occurs in Australian football, and that's true of uh, even in the soccer, so in the UEFA studies. So it does present a significant burden to, to teams and to the athletes but despite that, there's really not that much information around what to do, you know, in terms of diagnosis, in terms of risk factors, in terms of management. And so that's really kind of what pushed us or drove us towards that area a little bit more and, and you know, some of the res results that we'll talk to you about today. I've been practising clinically for 15 years and I really feel it was only in the more recent years I started to self-critique how I was managing calf strains. I think there's perhaps this oversimplification of it's the calf, you know, throw, throw a bit of stuff at it. But the more I look into it, the more tendency there is to realise that it's it's actually, there's quite a bit going on. Yeah. I, I actually find it quite quite challenging clinically. Uh, I think it can be a complicated area. That's, you know, there's some that are quite simple and they'll just kind of recover and there'll be no problems. But 
you know, there's there's the idea about the, the problem calf and it does seem to be quite an issue across a number of different sports. You know, a number of different teams will have a few players that have that problem calf and that just keeps going no matter no matter what they do. And so I think that's probably one thing that separates calf injuries a little bit. And it could just reflect that we're, you know, we don't know enough about, you know, the best the best management and and you know return to play timing and and criteria for return to play and things like that. So but yeah, I, I agree that it can be quite complex. Yeah, uh, and you mentioned there at the, the start of the recording tenure that calves differ from other strains. Now might be a good moment for yourself, Tanya and Brady, just to share around what you mean by that. Yeah, I mean, I think they can, and I'll throw to Brady in a second, but probably one of the main things in terms of the differentiation for other muscles is, uh, you know, the the extensive aponeurotic, uh, so the fascial tissue, so the the, the, the the collagen sort of tissue is quite different in in the calf compared to a lot of the other muscles. And the other thing I think that separates it a little bit is just how it's used in almost everything that we do. So no matter what you're doing, like in terms of locomotion, you know, you're walking slowly, you're running quickly, you're jumping, you're changing direction, the calf is just under pressure the whole time. So utilising it, you almost can't get away from it. Uh, So that's kind of has implications for your rehabilitation definitely and um, implications I suppose for looking at risk factors for recurrence and also just risk factors uh, for index injury too but I'll get Brady to comment further because he's probably got some other ideas. I think um, Tanya put that uh, really eloquently where ultimately it's a question of structure and function and the structural components of the calf you know aren't necessarily homogenous with what we see in our other compartments that we commonly uh, strain, like the hamstrings and the quadriceps, for example, uh, with those intramuscular aponeuroses and also intermuscular aponeuroses between soleus and gastroc, um, and the implications of the structure for the function. There's no escaping the fact that, you know, as soon as we're doing an elementary job, there's loads in the vicinity of multiple body weights going through the calf muscle tendon unit, uh, which is a different situation compared to, say, biceps femoris, um, where those loads are going to be far lower. Um, And that's potentially a reason for why we may need to think about different management and also different prevention for calf muscle strain injuries. No, that's great. Structure and function. Calf strains differ from other soft tissue strains like you both just referenced there, quadriceps, hamstrings, because of this structure and function. When you both referenced aponeuroses. Just for the listeners' sake, uh, how would you describe what the aponeuroses looks like and is? So they're essentially um, connective tissue bands uh, within the muscle that the muscle fibres either originate from or attach to. And because of this intimate relationship with the muscle fibres, there's constant force transmission between fibres and connective tissue Um, that functions, you know, in communication with the Achilles tendon being a free tendon, almost like a a spring-type mechanism. And what that means um, if we're doing something like jogging all the way up to sprinting, there's really large and rapid tensile loads uh, moving between our muscle fibres and our aponeurotic tissue um, that the calf needs to... Uh, attenuate and needs to also have the capacity to withstand in order not to break down. I mentioned about the really high loads that go through the muscle tendon unit, but it's also about the rate that they go through. So they're actually acting through the aponeuroses and the muscle fibres very, very quickly, which has implications for our our rehab and prevention practices as well. And I guess um, from a slightly less technical point of view, if if your listeners want to understand what the aponeurosis is, is sometimes they're considered to be like almost intramuscular tendons, so tendons within the muscle. And there is some controversy about that because they don't act like a tendon does. But it's kind of, you know, if you're chopping up your meat, your steak for the night, it's like the white parts in between, not the fat, but the stringy white parts in in the muscle. So it's kind of your connective tissue in the muscle. That's a great uh, graphical description there, Tanya. (laughs) 
I'm the Not son so of, good for the vegetarians. <laughs> yeah. and... I'm the son of a butcher. I think I played with meat growing up, so I, uh, <laughs> I, I think I was destined to work in uh, soft tissues somehow. Uh, in the running space, Tanya and Brady, there seems to be a particularly clinically, which is great to see things evolve, but a and even just anecdotally amongst runners, an appreciation that it's not all about the hips, the plantar flexors below the knee muscles, the calf musculature in, in loose parlance is responsible for so much propulsion. I know Dr. Rich Willie, you know, often cites generally 50% of running propulsion typically come from below the knee. Can you just share a little bit more from both of your knowledge banks around how much generation of force does come from these calf muscles? Yeah, so in steady state running at six metres per second, um, it's been measured in the vicinity of 12 and a half times body weight load, which is, of course, very, very high. And with consideration too for athletes, uh, particularly team sport athletes who are sprinting and accelerating faster than that, yeah, those loads are very, very high, um, even when they aren't necessarily running as intensely as they do um, throughout the course of the match. Is that Brady 12 and a half times for this, the, all the calf musculature mass, or was that Salaya specifically or the muscle on the top, the gastroc? Oh, so that, that particular study, um, was a force transducer implanted close to the Achilles tendon. So you'd consider that the entire muscle tendon unit where they haven't differentiated between soleus and gastroc. Yeah. What we see in some of the biomechanical analyses, is the peak soleus loads are met quite soon uh, once we start running and then they begin to taper off once we get over about seven metres per second and have a greater contribution from the more proximal muscles. And that's potentially implicated in why early post-injury, particularly soleus injuries, can be prone to recurrence as soon as we return to running or early in the running rehabilitation phase because the soleus simply doesn't have the capacity to withstand such high loads and it may not have such a high capacity to withstand really high rates of loading as well. Those two components, I think, that we need to consider as clinicians. Do you mean, Brady, just to clarify, it doesn't have the capacity on return to running or return to sport or just in general terms? Yeah, so a critical time point when we're managing these injuries is the return to running and the decision around when to recommence running after the strain uh, because if we sort of undershoot it and run too soon, the muscle may not have the capacity yet and that can set us up for an early recurrence, uh, which, you know, we saw in the AFL data um, over half of the recurrences occurred within two months of the date of the index strain. So this seems to be a really critical time period to get our, our decision correct. So it's a key key part, that first two months of return to running. And and Tanya, is there anything you'd add to Brady's comments there? I think, um, you know, there's another great Aspatar lecture uh, done by Craig Purdom. And and if anyone's heard Craig speak about calf injuries, you know, he has a fantastic slide where he looks at um, the loading rate and and just the overall load of the calf with different activities. As I was saying before, it's really hard to just get away from using your calf with everything that we do. And so, you know, he's he kind of talks about loads, you know, even 12 times body weight with particular activities. So, and if you're thinking about jumping, plyometric type activities, you know, that's an incredible load on your calf. Yeah, absolutely. And it's perhaps unsurprising in the AFL data, over 60% of re-injuries occurred as a result of a running-related mechanism of injury. Over 60% of re-injuries or recurrences were due to a running mechanism. Yep, so that's, you know, a steady-state running mechanism or acceleration, high-intensity running or sprinting, as well as sudden change of direction. Sudden change of direction. And is that classic table, I think, out of Dawn's work, what I mean, Peter Maliaris had published it just in a maybe a social post, but it looks like Celia seems to work quite hard no matter what the speed of running or the velocity of running, whereas gastroc and other muscles are more sort of phasic, they ramp up with the speed increase. And is that, is that an oversimplification of it? Is that something that we sort of know from a research point of view? Yeah, I think that's a good reflection of the function and the functional differences between Celia and gastroc. And there's other, other studies that direct us to understand that 
gastroc really kicks in at terminal time points of plantar flexion um, in our jumping and acceleration activities uh, where they've undertaken EMG analysis of uh, muscle activity. Um, and gastroc seems to, yeah, really ramp up as we do things more intensely um, and as we get to those more terminal time points of propulsion, um, almost like a last impetus of propulsion. Whereas Soleus is just Whereas pretty constant. Soleus is our workhorse that almost needs two opposing properties. It needs really high power output, but it also needs really good contractile endurance which from a self-signaling point of view, these are almost opposing properties of a muscle uh, when we're thinking about um, inducing adaptation in a muscle, power versus endurance. But they're certainly critical to consider in rehabilitation because if we don't and we just address, say, the power component, we'll lose out over time and with the endurance function. And similarly, if we just address the endurance component and forget about our power properties, And, of course, strength underpins both. Uh, We're not being comprehensive in our management. And and jumping ahead off that comment, Brady, you meant just to practically add on to that, you mentioned the contractile endurance, so the endurance of the soleus and the ability for it to generate force rapidly, the power component. Would that practically look like someone's rehabilitation, making sure it includes some rate of force stuff, so some faster stuff, plus some just go at it until you can't do it anymore, endurance-type building work yeah absolutely so based on some of the work from sue mays i think we understand now that there's no escaping the fact that calves require good strength endurance with the body weight calf raise and particularly if you're a running based athlete that needs to be in the vicinity of over 25 repetitions being very strict with concentric to eccentric phase one second to one second good mechanics, plantar flexing along the axes of the second metatarsal. There's no escaping just that basic body weight strength endurance capacity to ensure that we can work and contract over time. But then beyond that, we really get into the specifics of what we're preparing the car for, which means which sport we're returning to um, and also the athlete's role within that sport. In sports such as rugby, where they need to generate really high forces, relative strength and maximum strength uh, might be a far more important property than, say, in Australian rules football, where a um, loaded strength endurance measure um, is more relevant to how the calf needs to work during running activities versus a track runner who has very short ground contact times and perhaps our more power-based qualities are going to be of more clinical interest. In summary, what I'd suggest talking about the different strength qualities and the different power qualities and how endurance fits within that um, is that there should be a healthy spread between them all in a complete rehabilitation process to be really sure that you're getting all of the capacities within the calf that you need. You're getting your endurance component, you're developing strength well using loaded exercises, you're doing appropriate uh, plyometrics and appropriate stretch shortening cycle exercises, Um, and then you can be, you know, very happy that you've been comprehensive in your exercise selection. That's uh, brilliant uh, information. Tanya, anything you would add to that? Yeah, I think it just it also has implications for looking at risk as well. Mm. So, you know, you can't just assess somebody's strength. You know, can you do, I think it's a great place to start, can you do 25 beautiful calf raises, as Brady described, but then you also need to look at, you know, do they have good rate of force development? Can they actually propel their body as required for whatever their sport is? So I think, you know, we we did the systematic re- review on risk factors and there wasn't there's not a lot out there but yeah. um, and we are actually looking at that in another project with the calf project with Aspatar but there, uh, currently there's not a great way to assess objectively assess those things necessarily but I think you know you can't just leave it at just pure strength and you can't just leave it at just endurance you kind of have to look as Brady said at all of those different qualities and what's required um, for the different sports as well yeah and quantifying out in in people's homes or in general clinics day-to-day clinics that sometimes don't have access to resources 
where those key variables can be quantified, there's no real easy fix there, is there? I mean, it's, it is, it's fortunately infiltration of, you know, different bits of testing equipment finding their way into clinics that can make measurability a bit easier, but it, it historically has been almost impossible, right, at a clinic yeah. level for, for most. Yeah, and- Absolutely. At an absolute minimum in the clinic, um, and, you know, I still work just in a suburban clinic, you know, you would be looking at things like that car phrase endurance. But, you know, if you could identify at least some of the power qualities required, it might be, you know, repeat efforts on a particular plyometric exercise or, or something like that where you can evaluate you know, side to side if there's differences based, you know, based on who else you've seen. If you if you look at a few people from a single team that come through the clinic, that type of thing. But, uh, you know, for your average running athlete, you know, the weekend warrior type athlete, it, it may be sufficient to look at something like that calf raise endurance um, and just seeing if there's side to side differences, can they reach 25 um, both sides without any issues? If they can't do that, then they definitely wouldn't have the power anyway. But so it's a good place to start, I think, from a clinical perspective. Uh, you mentioned risk factors, just exploring that a little bit more. Tenny, you said that there's not a lot of risk factors out there. Uh, you both spent, uh, no doubt, many hours putting out the 2017 paper. I th- think it was included 518 calf strains from maybe about, maybe about 10 papers. Uh, yeah. And I rewatched this last night and, my takeaway in a fatigue state was age and prior history, plus or minus maybe a few others. But what would you share around risk factors for, for the listener, known risk factors for calf strain injuries? Yeah, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right in terms of that systematic review. It kind of demonstrated what we chatted about before, that there's not a, a heap of research out there. Um, and, you know, when we did the systematic review in 2017, it was – essentially age and, and past history as, as strong kind of risk factors, but we sort of all know that. Um, we know that if someone's getting older, they're more susceptible, and we know whenever you've had an injury in the past, you're probably more susceptible to get that same injury again. There was also some information, you know, some moderate kind of association between other low, lower limb injuries and risk factor for calf, and, you know, we could hypothesise that that's just simply because they've had time off because they of those injuries and they haven't um, regained the capacity of the calf because that goes very quickly. So if you stop loading the calf, you actually get, you know, pretty quick kind of atrophy and and loss of capacity of the calf. Um, It could also just point out, point to those people being older because they had other lower limb injuries as well or that, Mm -hmm. that they have some, you know, genetic kind of predisposition from a collagen point of view so there's there's lots of potential theories as to why you know lower limb injuries generally might um, predispose you to a calf injury but I think the takeaway really is that there's not a heap that's being done and obviously with some of Brady's work and as I said with the Aspatar calf project hopefully we understand we can start to understand a little bit more about those risk factors and and just you know because no one's even looked at um, calf strength and and does that predispose someone to um, a calf injury so when we've done our study interviewing 20 experts around the world and asked them about risk factors you know a lot of that calf capacity was what they talked about but just from a research point of view nobody's looked at that sort of thing yet something i'll add as well around um you know ultimately while we're evaluating risk factors is because we're interested in preventing these injuries and certainly clinically athletes with these factors of being older having a specific calf injury history having a history of other lower limb soft tissue injuries these are the athletes that we manage very closely from a calf strain injury point of view Mm. Um, and this is where we check off that we aren't overexposing them so what that means it means is we're tracking their gps data very closely in terms of um, overall workload or how many kilometres or metres they're doing overall and the specific bandwidth that the calf needs to work really hard um, and that we're not having really sudden spikes. And if we've had time off, yeah, equally, we're not ramping up too quickly uh, because I think clinically everyone has examples where somebody's had a different injury a surgical procedure, perhaps an illness that's meant a week of training has been wiped out 
And then in the aftermath of that, the athlete or the patient has developed some calf symptoms. Um, so from that exposure perspective, um, we need to be really diligent as physiotherapists in what we're monitoring. And then, of course, with the age, what exactly does that mean? Is it a correlate of greater exposure and injury history? Is it a correlate that as we're getting older, we're losing muscle function and we're undergoing atrophy? We know that as we age, we get fascicle shortening in the calf, we get atrophy of the calf. We also have a more compliant muscle tendon unit, so we lose some of that stiffness property, uh, which might mean that when we're running, our foot is on the ground for longer, and then therefore we're going through a larger length excursion and we're loading the calf for longer than if we have shorter ground contact times. We need to think about these things in a lot of detail as clinicians from a prevention point of view as well. Uh, but again, these are speculations and at this point we don't have uh, data to support this, but more an illustration of the things to think about on the basis of this research. Yeah, the, the risk factors, uh, I recall Rich Willie, Dr. Rich Willie, sharing that uh, a great example of the suction cap effect almost as we mature in to, across our lifespan as runners where they're, those properties you just mentioned, Brady, do produce that runner that we can all visualise. It just seems to be stuck a little bit to the ground as, as we you know, mature into the decades. Mechanism of injury, Brady and Tanya, I certainly had this wrong throughout my early years of the, my professional clinical career where I expected every calf strain that ever occurred to have a an acute mechanism of injury, a known, did you feel a twang or did you feel it go? Yeah. And I pridefully could put my hand up after 30 years of running and say up until the last two years, I'd never had a calf strain, but I'm quite happy to have had one because I was surprised it was nothing more than a feeling of tightness that at the end of the run then eventuated into a distinct feeling of soreness. So can you speak to the mechanism of injury and any mistaken beliefs around how calf strains need to come on? Uh, with Brady's research uh, with the AFL data, we certainly found that um, it was around, I think it was around half or just over half of the injuries occurred with no inciting event uh, so that they just felt it was a gradual onset or they couldn't remember anything happening in the game basically. So that was much more likely with soleus injuries. Um, so, yeah, so over half of the 184 injuries that we looked at were were actually just sort of gradual onset or, or, or nothing that they could recall. So that's, you know, exactly what you're talking about, Brad, so nothing going ping. Mm. And look, the majority were felt of those were felt kind of after the game. So post-game, they felt a bit sore, you know, something wasn't quite right. So it wasn't necessarily even something that stopped them during the game, but it was after the game that they reported some tightness and then, you know, subsequently get a scan or, you know, have a clinical assessment and it identified that they actually had a, a calf injury, calf strain injury. And we can theorise why this might be the case in that potentially the really high proportion of slow twitch fibres in the soleus um, may be prone to cumulative failure and that it's almost um, a cumulative or evolving pathology in a different way than, say, a rectus femoris strain during kicking or a biceps femoris strain during sprinting. Um, so potentially the structure of the soleus um, is one reason for that injury pattern. Um, there's also really complex innovation to the, particularly the deep posterior lower leg, and that could result in just a different perception of symptoms and also a different threshold that we start to perceive discomfort and how that localises over time versus some of our other, other commonly injured muscles, which tend to be in more superficial compartments of the lower limb. Um, so potentially an impact of the structure, the innovation could lead to that pattern for soleus. Uh, but, of course, gastrocnemius, it's almost always a different situation. You strain your gastrocnemius, you know when it's happened, you've been accelerating, jumping, generally doing something really high with high intensity and a speed component, um, and often there's a combined um, knee extension and rapid dorsiflexion uh, where the strains occurred. And, again, gastrocnemius is a almost exclusively um, fast-twitch muscle compared to soleus um, and that fits the picture with how we see and how other muscle strain injuries present. So that's really key information for not just the practitioner in the field but also the everyday recreational or recreationally competitive or elite runner 
in terms of uh, that important bit of the uh, the history, did you feel it acutely during an event or training uh, session, or was it uh, more of a subtle onset after? Yeah. yeah. And, and this can potentially have prognostic implications as well, where we evaluated time to return to play post calf strain, um, and overall in our first study, um, injuries that occurred during running related mechanisms. So the athletes well aware of how it happened and when it happened at a particular point in time, um, they have a significantly longer time to return to play than athletes who presented with no specific inciting event. Um, so that's potentially a really useful clinical piece of information, regardless of whether you have MRI available to you or not, mm. um, that there's a prognostic difference based on how the calf strain presents. So longer recovery time if you did feel an acute. Yeah. Yep. Um, and simply put, if somebody's telling you, I accelerated and I felt my calf pop and I could barely walk, that seems to be different to I pulled up a bit tight after I ran the tightness hung around and didn't go away for a few days. And then when I tried to run again, it was still there and I had to stop running after a kilometre or so. You're listening to Dr. Tanya Pizzari and Brady Green on this expert edition of the Physical Performance Show, exploring all things calf strain rehabilitation. Support for today's show comes from Earshot's Bluetooth headphones. If you are a cyclist or runner who charges and are sick of your earphones dislodging or your earphones going flat, then look no further than Earshot's Bluetooth headphones for a winning solution. Earshot's were forged in the heart of New Zealand's rugged national parks by CEO and co-founder James Bell Booth, who himself was sick of his own earphones dislodging from his ears. Earshot's use their patented and proprietary Bluetooth magnetic headphone design, which will ensure that your earphones do not dislodge. Now, the team have generously offered up 10% off your own purchase of your Earshot's Bluetooth headphones simply by using the code TPPS for 10% off at checkout. Your own set of Earshot's Bluetooth headphones, normally retailing at $169.75. Earshot's Bluetooth headphones for cyclists and runners who charge. Support for today's episode also comes from our upcoming live stream event, Fueling for the Endurance Athlete, scheduled for the 4th of September with very popular former expert edition guest of the show, UK-based sports dietitian, Dr. Rinny McGregor from episode 258. Now, during this three-hour live stream event, Dr. Rinny McGregor will share around four key learning modules. Session one, what do we mean by the endurance athlete? Session two, common myths, lighter makes you faster. Session three, should we treat male and female athletes the same? And session four, common pitfalls, red S and the consequences. Tickets are just $49 available over at pogophysio.com.au forward slash live stream, Rinny McGregor. Or of course, for our patrons of the Physical Performance Show, we'll grant you complimentary access for your support of the show. And on that, if you would like to support the production of the show, you can do so over at Patreon. Simply search The Physical Performance Show and there you can pledge your support from just $5 per month and receive access to all upcoming live stream events, including the 4th of September event with Dr. Rinny McGregor. And of course, all of our back catalogued events, including Dr. Shona Harrelson and Dr. Stephen Siler. Now, massive thanks to this week's new patron, Jason Miller. Jason is a keen triathlete, and you can find Jason over on Instagram at jace27721. Jason, thank you for your support. For now, let's jump back with this week's expert edition featuring Tanya Pizzari, PhD, and Brady Green, Latrobe Sport and Exercise Medicine Centre researchers and physiotherapists from Mill Park Physiotherapy on this expert edition exploring all things calf strain rehabilitation. Examples of return to play, and it always depends, as you both shared, on the demands of what someone's returning to. But let's say talk about a recreational runner training for a half marathon or the Melbourne Marathon or whatever it may be. Could you share a little bit around the differences in recovery times from a something like you said, an acceleration type of injury where there was a distinct pop 
through to a more of a Celeus type presentation? Tough question, I know. Yeah. I <laughs> so the main the main difference was about it was a, it added about eleven days yep. from memory um, if it was a running related mechanism, and the means around return to sport with in in I mean this is in the AFL as well, so you need to consider that was around 24, 24 days post any calf yep. injury. Um, so, yeah, you're kind of adding a week or two if it was um, a running-related mechanism. And that's to return to just some sense of running, Tanya? That's no, that's to return to play. To, yep. to, to full play. Yeah. 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 It took so. longer to return to running, absolutely, but, yeah, to full play. They're kind of, you know, they're, they're around. The, and remember, it's a mean, so yeah. it can be really anywhere between about seven days and, and probably about 100. But, um, yeah. yeah, so... So, but that's kind of what you're looking at. Three, three to four weeks, I suppose, being out, and then you know, there's other things that will impact on on that as well. And a logical progression. Thank you, Tanya Brady. A logical progression would be: How does someone start to return to running? As a practitioner, I find challenging, perplexing, and interesting the fact that it seems to be an art and science. Return to run programs, maybe more <laughs> art in many ways than science. So. Any tips you'd share around returning someone to running uh, with a calf strain injury? Yeah, I think starting really simply, um, there's no escaping the value of our meat and potato things that we do as physiotherapists where, you know, we're monitoring very closely um, how long it takes to return to pain-free walking, the length of palpation tenderness um, and how quickly that resolves the restoration of single leg calf raise capacity and how long that takes, um, as well as the restoration of range of motion uh, with like a dorsiflexion lunge measure, as well as a straight knee stretch. Um, So early on, we're really getting an impression based on how these basic clinical measures are restoring versus not restoring of how we're going and what we're estimating about when an appropriate time to return to running may be. Um, And you're also getting good information from your patient or your athlete based on their um, ability to perform the exercises that you give them. So the ones that, you know, quite soon they're tolerating single leg calf raises through range, they're executing from a technical perspective perfectly, they're able to carry out loaded strengthening in bent knee and also straight knee position um, and begin to develop some good strength endurance, uh, whether it's a Smith machine or a seed calf raise machine. Um, So suddenly you're getting confidence that they're having the endurance component as well as the absolute strength component. And during this time, which is part of the art, you're obviously introducing, reintroducing, I should say, the muscle tendon unit to stretch shortening cycle loads Um, and really elementary activities with that require the stretch and the shortening component like bilateral skipping, run drills, you know, A skips, pogo skips, starting with two feet and then single leg. Um, And the progressions I typically work with there um, are bilateral first always and then unilateral afterwards. But you you should expect that, if you've tracked the meat and potatoes clinical markers well and thoroughly, you've got confidence that they have load tolerance from their single leg calf raises and loaded strengthening. And in the background, they've built up some capacity with some low level skipping and plyometric activities that it'll be appropriate to return to running, which might be a few days later than you would return to running for, say, a hamstring strain. And that's okay because what we find is that it doesn't necessarily slow up the rehabilitation process if you save your run to a little bit later Mm. um, and it offsets that risk of recurrence early in your rehab rehabilitation process. A clinical test Really simply, if a patient or athlete's able to do submaximal vertical hopping for 20 repetitions or 30 seconds on the spot and they have no focal calf symptoms or no development of the awareness, creeping, heart attack type tightness, um, they're generally ready to recommence running. That's a brilliant tip about not rushing 
to get that first run started with the perception that you're losing days, those extra couple of days you just share there, Brady, can see an overall uh, better return. Yeah, absolutely. The other thing to consider is that because calves do often come on with just that gradual onset, you, you can't necessarily use pain as a guide uh, with exercise or return to running uh, as a guide to, you know, how it's, how they're going to go with it. Whereas with a lot of other, you know, so for example, hamstring muscle injuries, you know, you, you can get them to go for a run and if they have that, they do often get that perception of tightness or pain and you can pull them up there and, and stop the stop the activity. Whereas calves, you might not actually get that until, you know, later a few hours afterwards or the next day or, you know, because you it doesn't necessarily for those reasons Brady explained previously, it might not be a good indicator. So that kind of pain is not a good indicator um, for whether they're going to cope with the running or not. And so, the other thing that's different with return to running, sorry, Brad, is okay. that, you know, with a hamstring, you can get someone to just go off for a little jog as a start because you don't use your biceps fem uh, very much when you're just jogging. Um, you can't do that with a calf because we know that, as we keep saying, this is particularly the soleus is working all the time. Mm. And so if you go and try and, you know, get them to just get some endurance in their calf, you know, some some you know, air in their lungs and get the heart pumping, uh, it can really backfire on you. So you have to be a bit more particular, as Brady was pointing out, and make sure you feel like they're ready to run. And in some cases, it's better that they're running a bit faster initially, doing those drills, getting the, using the stretch shortening cycle than just plotting a couple of laps around the oval. And is that to try and offset some of that cumulative fatigue that poses so, a risk for Solace? It was funny when we um, surveyed in our qualitative study, the practices and perspective of experts from around the world, um, it was a really consistent theme that a nice recipe for a recurrence is to tell your athlete or patient for their first run to go and jog five laps or to jog for 10 minutes and they'll get that constant work of the muscle mm -hmm. that results in a fatigue-related recurrence because they just don't have the capacity to withstand that, that type of loading just yet working through that data, it seemed to be more beneficial for a first run prescription to be more in the vicinity of 60 or 80 or 100 metre run throughs with rest between versus a run that you might prescribe for a run of the mill hamstring strain if you want to be uh, avoiding a recurrence. And those run throughs are accelerating or steady state typically, Brady? at a faster pace and you would at a steady trot. Some yes. degree of acceleration, I guess. <laughs> Just going from a steady yeah, it's, start. It's, it's within comfortable limits as well. Yeah. Um, and this is where, you know, you need to know um, the athlete or the patient that you're dealing with and how their function is at that point in time and, uh, you know, base your judgment around those factors, how quickly you're going to tell them to run. But you certainly don't need to, to spook them and, and make them sprint and accelerate suddenly, <laughs> which has happened in the past, but you certainly don't, don't need to make them plod and just really jog and have really long ground contact times where, you know, they're just working through their calf the whole time. Um, it's kind of like a comfortable, happy medium that's a good guideline. Yeah, this is probably this is probably the art side of things. Yeah. But one thing I wanted to add as well, you know, we talk a lot about um, you know strengthening in the vertical direction and developing nice capacity with exercises like a single leg calf raise and um, getting in the Smith machine and doing seated and standing calf raises in the Smith machine. Which ultimately, with the way we're working that tissue is predominantly in a vertical direction. Um, we know that when we're running, we have the horizontal component, which seems to be very important, particularly in our team sport athletes who are accelerating very frequently and also running very quickly, um, that in our exercise selection from as early as possible, we should be prescribing exercises with a horizontally directed force, um, which are, of course, more demanding on the muscle tendon unit than vertically oriented exercises but they seem to be beneficial for preparing it for the activities that it's going to encounter. And it also enables us to take the muscle tendon unit through a greater 
uh, length and a greater range of motion um, and to be sure that we are stressing the tissue through a greater range of motion akin to what it will account, encounter when we're planning our foot to change direction, when we're accelerating from an inert position, um, which even if you investigate some of the um, photos of what you see in Australian rules football and soccer, some of these guys go into quite pronounced dorsiflexion, really large length excursions. Um, so we need to prepare them for that. Um, and I know that uh, Craig Purdom's a, an advocate for this as well, and I've seen I'm mentally picturing a particular slide that he shows at this point in time too. But, yeah, I just wanted to emphasise that addressing that horizontal component for force generation and also the lengthening demands is a key clinical consideration. And examples, practical examples of that horizontal force component, Brady, what are we talking about here? Sled pushes or static wall running, pushing into the wall? Yeah, or yeah so so the wall series, um, like A position series at the wall, uh, pushing forwards and upwards on almost an oblique axis is a good starting point. Um, you can do things very early on post-injury, such as modified donkey calf raises, with the trunk um, in a hinged type position and also adjust whether you're in a position of knee flexion or knee extension. And then as they're develop, developing capacity just with their body weight, um, you can do exercises such as calf raising to a step um, with dumbbells or with a barbell um, where you're really pushing that load forwards through range um, and graduating that exercise to then be doing sled walks to be pushing the prowler, even farmers' walks and things of that nature. Yeah. And one, th one thing I'll just add about things like prowler and sled, similar to the theme around restoring the power component and the endurance component, uh, when we're getting to high-end calf function and we're doing horizontally oriented exercises, it's a good idea to develop both absolute power output and also... That requires... Selective exercise prescription, not just a standing body weight calf raise. Not just a standing, no, we've, <laughs> we've moved it beyond just the standing yeah. body weight calf raise. <laughs> and uh, Tanya, anything uh, else on the rehabilitation? Thank you, Brady, that you would add conceptually. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking for the listener that might be still thinking that stretching the calf will help uh, or poking and prodding it. But uh, anything that, you know, some of their beliefs might be a little bit challenged. Uh, anything that you'd add, Tanya? Um, I probably, the, the, the other thing as well as, you know, the horizontal vertical component is that it's a multi-directional type um, complex so that you, you also need to retrain that change of direction. And so even doing some of your calf raising with, say, uh, you know, a band, a theraband or, or a gym band around the person's waist that, that's pulling them laterally or medial, you know, pulling them one way or the other while they're doing it is a really nice way to just start to get that multi-directional component. And then doing things, you know, Brady was talking about the, you know, step lunge or step up to a step, but, but stepping to the side as well. So getting that, you know, change of direction side to side. And then obviously you can start to incorporate some hopping and side to side hopping and change of direction and, and things like that. So I think we've got to remember that component, probably not as important for a, a runner, but certainly if you're going back to field-based running sports and that's going to be critical. Um, but, yeah, I do think, you know, challenging, they're challenging some of the thoughts about, I mean, manual therapy, you know, probably still does have an important component in the early stages, you know, normalising tone and um, if there's kind of, you know, other, other areas of the lower limb that you recognise might be part of the contributing factors, particularly with the feet, um, you know, dorsiflexion range, some of those kind of, things that can impact the biomechanics of the lower limb you might be working on along the way uh, as they're sort of gaining, regaining that capacity. So I don't think that sort of stuff has to be thrown out completely, but you can't dry needle somebody back to a sport, that's for sure. <laughs> so you really have to, you know, incorporate all the things that Brady spoke about as, and, you know, getting the running and just building that endurance and the capacity back in the calf because, you know, we spoke very early on about what a strain is and it's just the, you know, the, the activity exceeding the capacity of the muscle and so the rehab is actually building the capacity of the muscle too so that that can actually do any activity that's required. 
You're listening to Tanya Pizzari, PhD, and Brady Green, Latrobe Sport and Exercise Medicine Centre researchers and physiotherapists, Mill Park Physiotherapy, on this expert edition of the Physical Performance Show, exploring all things calf strain rehabilitation. Now, if you missed last week's episode, it was an expert edition featuring David Bailey, Head of Performance for UCI's professional cycling team, Bahrain Victorious. It's been an incredibly popular episode, launched on the eve of the 2021 Tour de France. And here's a little snippet of Dr. David Bailey's sharings. For me, it's, it, the, the concept of marginal gains is quite simple. It, performance is multifactorial. So it makes sense to break it down into its margins. And, you know, that's what we do. We look at performance, we break it down, and then we invest resource into those which we believe bring the biggest marginal return. I really drive people's thinking to say, okay, well, you know, at the end of the day, we can quantify performance to some extent. You know, how important is that guy's chain lubrication versus his altitude training camp? you come away hopefully with a a bunch of factors that are really fundamental marginal gains yeah and then there are probably a bunch of factors that are moderate and then the ones that are just sort of icing on the cake if you like and i think you find a lot of the icing on the cake ones are the ones that make the headlines to enjoy the full episode jump over to wherever it is you enjoy the physical performance show from you'll find us now also on youtube whilst there peruse the archives that in right packed episode one featuring surf life saving iron man champion Ali Day. For now, let's jump back with this week's expert edition guests, Dr. Tanny Pizzari and Brady Green, Latrobe Sport and Medicine Exercise Centre researchers and physiotherapists on this expert edition exploring all things calf strain rehabilitation. That dorsiflexion, the amount of ankle bend, you know, for, the, for the listener that's not familiar with that term, is there any scientific correlation to calf strain risk or anecdotal from the uh, qualitative qualitative studies that you yeah. did with the experts. Uh, I think it might have been mentioned, but yeah, because you see runners, I mean, runners are athletes with varying ranges of dorsiflexion. Yeah. I've often been challenged by the thought that everyone needs to hit a certain target. I mean, yeah. any, anything you'd add to this, guys? Yeah, so hypermobility can be problematic um, when we have really large um, length excursions that occur. Say somebody has a knee to wall of 20 centimetres um, and we can expect during the stance phase of running, particularly if they have long ground contact times, they're going to undergo far greater length excursion through the calf muscle tendon unit and the time under tension while it's lengthening will be greater. Um, So that can potentially be problematic. Um, And in those situations, that could also direct us to interventions specifically for those athletes when they are rehabilitating, such as focusing on exercises that result in shorter ground contact times and greater muscle tendon unit stiffness. So perhaps they're not getting this this scenario. On the flip side of that, you can have somebody who has very, very limited ankle dorsiflexion range. And it's conceivable that if you do, the actual focal tissue stress could be just in a part of the muscle instead of distributed along the entire course, uh, particularly if they're not getting into greater ranges. But I think the ankle function side of things um, is definitely an area to investigate. Um, As Tanya mentioned, in our patients with problem calves and repeat recurrences. Um, And we found um, from the AFL data that having a history of an ankle injury specifically um, increased the risk of an early recurrence. Um, So what does that mean? As clinicians, we need to investigate further. Um, And we also potentially need to intervene around the ankle um, and give, you know, intrinsic stabilising exercises to ensure that our function around our ankle joint is as good as it can be to support calf function. Team, there's a lot, a lot more that we could explore. Obviously, the, we're constrained by time. And thank you for your sharing so far. If you had to boil everything you've learned, this is a very challenging question that every featured expert of the, the show gets asked. Everything you've learned into one piece of advice around this topic to help listeners perform at their best with their calf strain rehab or prevention, what would Brady Green's top tip be? And consider your thesis uh, approved, I think, Brady, after that effort. Uh, and then what would uh, Tanya Pizzari's top tip be? <laughs> top tip is to know your patient very well and start with the end goal in mind. Beautiful. <laughs> Tanya, uh, have you got a top tip 
for Brady's address to the clinicians, maybe the, the field yeah, athlete thinking, out there. Yeah, I was thinking about a top tip for the athlete really is um, probably don't neglect your calves. It's easy to do in the gym. Uh, you know, calf exercises sometimes seem, I don't know, a little bit simple. You, you run out of time. It's like doing your abs at the end. You go, I'll do it later, and you never actually do it. So I would that would probably be my tip to the athlete is don't neglect your calves. Um, so get do some calf raises, you know, seated, standing, you know, maybe even think about some plyometric type stuff if, if that's what your sport requires as well. Um, but, yeah, try and get at least the base level of strength and a little bit of power in as an athlete, or even if you're just kind of plodding along the streets, particularly as you get older, calf capacity disappears very quickly. And is it a case of just something's better than nothing? I think people often get overwhelmed that if they can't do the whole prescription, they'll do nothing. But is yeah, just- I, yeah, I don't think you have to do it every time. And, I, you know, you don't have to do four different type of exercises. But I think at least if there's a calf exercise somewhere in your program, um, then, yeah, definitely something's better than nothing. Yeah, brilliant. And finally, uh, Brady and Tanya, every guest, in this case, guests of the show issue listeners with a physical challenge for the week. So um, <laughs> this could be on topic or it could be uh, not on topic, but what is uh, the conjoined uh, physical challenge going to be from Brady and Tanya? Well, I think, you know, very, very simply and just with what we've been chatting about, I think to be able to do a single leg calf raise with really nice form, so, you know, going straight through that your second toe basically, not deviating, and being able to do, go up for one second and down for one second and doing that 25 times on each side with that perfect form, I think that's a physical challenge. And if you can't do that, then my advice from previous also is uh, pertinent and you need to do some calf work. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, get it done wherever you can, whenever you can. Absolutely. Fair game, putting fuel in the car too. I do tend to try and knock out a few reps with the old uh, (laughs) fuel in the car up. (laughs) That's a good tip. And uh, tell you, well, thank you for your contribution to the show. And you're both practicing clinicians there at Mill Park Physiotherapy. Is that correct? In uh... um, Brady's now at the Essendon Football Club. So, uh, yeah. Yes, so we change. Had to, we had to hand him over. <laughs> so, Brady, uh, you're working there in the AFL. Tenure available in private practice. Both obviously very active researchers contributing enormously to the field. So so thank you. And uh, you're both active on Twitter. Where can listeners find you on Twitter? Um, I'm not that active, but I am on Twitter. It's uh, <laughs> at Dr. Tanya Pizzari, which is pizza with an R-I. And uh, at Brady D. Green. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. We'll tag that up in the show notes. And thank you once again, Brady and Tanya. Thank, thank you for you. having us. Thanks, Brad. So there you have it, another episode of the Physica Performance Show, and I trust and I know you enjoyed Tanya Pizzari and Brady Green's share-ins. Now, if you did, please reach out, let them know what it was that you enjoyed from today's episode. You'll find them over on Twitter at Dr. Tanya Pizzari, P-I-Z-A-A-R-I, and Brady D. Green, B-R-A-D-Y-D Green. And of course, keep the podsies coming. That's simply a screenshot of the episode that you're enjoying and tagging in the show at Physical Performance Show over on Instagram. You'll find the show over on Facebook and YouTube. And for all show notes, jump over to pogophysio.com.au forward slash podcast. And once again, thank you to both Brady and Tanya for their generous contribution amongst a very busy AFL football season for Brady in clinic work for both Brady and Tanya at Mill Park Physiotherapy in Melbourne, Victoria, and of course, their many research obligations and commitments. Now, as you heard, we are very excited to have locked in the first live stream event for 2021 for the Physical Performance Show, featuring Rinny McGregor, UK-based sports dietitian from episode 258, whose episode has been incredibly popular. And Rinny will be presenting a live stream event fueling for the endurance athlete between 3 and 6 p.m. Brisbane Australian Eastern Standard Daylight Savings Time. Now, if you cannot make that time for the live stream, rest assured, a post-event recording will be made available to all registrants. Tickets are just $49, which include PDF copies of all of the four modules to be covered by Rinny McGregor. Now, for our patron Physical Performance Show Learnings members, you'll receive your complimentary access pass for the live stream event. 
And it's not too late to become a patron of the show. Simply jump over to Patreon, search for the Physical Performance Show, and there you can pledge your support. Now, if you are an endurance athlete frustrated by bone, tendon, or joint-related concerns, then Pogo Physio's online 45-minute telehealth consultations can, as we say at Pogo Physio, help you get back to your physical best and across your physio finish line. Here's a great example of telehealth physiotherapy being effective in arriving at outcomes shared by recreationally competitive triathlete Sarah from Tasmania. Hey, I'm Sarah. I'm a competitive age group triathlete from Australia and telehealth 100% works. I did telehealth with Brad for chronic sesamoiditis and I didn't need any hands-on treatment. I had exercise prescription and load management with my training and this along with Brad's expertise and genuine care got me across my pogo finish line. So if you're stuck and would like some assistance, do reach out b.beer at pogophysio.com.au or jump over to pogophysio.com.au forward slash telehealth. A massive thanks as always to the great folk who make this show possible each and every week. Daryl Misson, our audio engineer, Susan Wilkin on all things show administration and Matthew Walding on all things show graphic design. And of course, another huge thank you to today's show sponsor, Earshot's Bluetooth headphones. I know of many listeners of the show who have jumped over, redeemed the code, 10% off the $169.75 retail price and have been enjoying their Earshot's Bluetooth headphones. So if you're sick of your headphones falling out or going flat, Earshot's Bluetooth headphones are your solution. If you have any feedback for the show, how we can make it better, a guest you'd like to hear from, or you simply want to relay the learnings you've been taking from the show, you'll find me over on social media at Brad underscore beer. And as prior mentioned, my email b.beer at pogophysio.com.au. All feedback is welcome. Now, coming up on next week's episode of the Physical Performance Show, we keep the learnings coming your way. And we were very excited to catch up with founder of Effortless Swimming, Brenton Ford, for an expert edition exploring all things optimizing your stroke for peak swimming performance. If you're yet to come across Brenton, he is prolific in the social media space with Effortless Swimming. And whether you are a beginner, experienced, or elite swimmer, triathlete, or someone who likes to just swim for recovery, perhaps from your running training, then there is something in next week's episode for you. So be sure to be tuning in next week for Brenton Ford of Effortless Swimming. Until then, keep pursuing your physical best performance. I'm Brad Beer, and this has been the Physical Performance Show.